Um, ladies and gentlemen, welcome to the fourth roundtable for United Nations Habitat uh, Agenda 3 plus 5. So um, that's the new urban agenda for Southeast Queensland. I'd like to welcome our chair today or our, our special um, welcomer and chair and provocateur today, our president of United Nations Association of Australia in Queensland, Claire Moore. Thank you, Claire. Thank you, Danelle, and welcome to everyone who's joining us this afternoon. I'm with you from Mianjan in Brisbane on the traditional lands of the Turbul and Yagawa peoples, and we acknowledge the long-standing contribution to our nation that the traditional owners have made and we pay our respects to them and to peoples of all cultures. Uh, welcome and thank you for joining us. I know Danelle has got the um, UNAAQ anthem oh, ready to go. Yep. Okay. Go Fair enough. She is our mother, honour each person, a sister and brother, honour the Every elders, share with each other, then we will the land to come. Then rain will come the land to come. Thank you. Beautiful anthem. And thank you always to Auntie Ruby, Ruby for sharing that with us. Uh, now I'll pass over to Danelle, who will get, introduce the speakers and provide the format for this afternoon's session. Danelle. Okay. Okay, um, I'm an immediate past president of the United Nations Association. I'm a past um, executive and board member of United uh, Urban Design Alliance, and I'm a mentor for United Nations young professionals. We try to have young representation in our debates and Indigenous influence in the way that we make decisions. And I'm a bit errant this week because the only youth I have speaking or involved today are in our team. So I'd like to introduce our team. Ritva, the, the mysterious lady with the light behind her. Um, Pam Caspani. And yes, I'm still calling you a youth. And of course, our, our third wonderful woman is Elizabeth Harrison. Um, so thank you, those youth. Now, Sean Tui isn't that young. I think you're Sean, you're from... Um, you were in Bundaberg, it says you're in Brisbane now. And yeah, I got sucked into the vortex of Brisbane. Oh, okay. Well, welcome <laughs> back home. Um, and uh, I don't know the other ages. So I'm just probably not. I, so I really wanted to plug this bit about youth because we really need to hear from them. So um, most important, we haven't got Auntie Ruby with us at the moment. She hasn't got her voice this week. So um, we, um, and we have Indigenous women usually uh, who are, uh, have this wonderful connection to Southeast Queensland and the land who, who are part of our um, debates every month. So <clears throat> we try to be respectful and try to be future oriented. And the young people set us straight usually. So um, I'd like to just um, flick over to our, um, to our slides, please, because I don't really think you want to listen, look at my face all day. However, on that note, I made it up specially so you can look at my face. So, okay. So let me introduce... <clears throat> oh, sorry, I haven't got everything open. There we go. We don't have the slides up. Okay, let's let's define what we think the environment, uh, the economy is. <clears throat> First of all, in uh, 1776, a fellow called Adam Smith talked about the wealth of nations, and that's where economy, the words economy, came from. The wealth of nations back in those days, which is only a 24-page 
very scrappily typed paper talks about healthy people, uh, the productivity of the land, the productivity of the way that it did trade, the employment um, numbers and um, healthy, healthy land. So that's the way they looked at economy back in those days or defined it. We have changed it and become very sophisticated about what economy means now. So that's our starting point. Our next <coughs> uh, slide <coughs> really should talk about where, <coughs> um, what we want for our future. So can anyone, everyone see that on the screen? So our futures could look like what the past has looked like which might have been 1776 in some other place, but might have that could have been um, Brisbane, Port of Brisbane or, or Brisbane uh, 50 years ago. However, what we're aiming for, of course, is the sort of future that's got all these 51 special attributes that make it livable with healthy people, healthy resources, plenty of opportunity for innovation, plenty of opportunity for education and the sorts of things, uh, clean water, living with climate, all those sorts of things that we need uh, and to be able to be uh, physically resilient, but also uh, have a quality of life, which is also a measure, our important measure of an economy. So our next slide. <coughs> So the way that we were benchmarking in the past really looked, this 2003 report was based on the six headline indicators and Howard, John Howard was our person putting the six. He did some interesting things, but this is one of the good things that actually helped us benchmark accounts across 25 other regions in the area in, um, with our dashboards across the UN habitat. So this, <clears throat> these six indicators, again, our well-being can be very well linked, very um, linked with economy because well-being is includes our economic well-being. But the sorts of things that were being measured specifically under the economic banner was productivity of people. So for every person who had a job, there was a unit conversion that turned it into better than it was before. So it wasn't necessary slave labour chipping rocks. It's actually every ounce of energy and effort and unit of convert, uh, was converted into something much better so that we became more productive with our time and our energy. We also looked at industry and how strong industry was and how resilient it was and how innovative in the way that it was able, <coughs> um, innovation was mainly measured by patents in those times. And of course, uh, we've got a lot more ways of measuring innovation now. Now, economic security is a really interesting part and it gets back to how do people work? Do they have jobs? Can they pay their bills? But economic security was much more than that when we looked at how Southeast Queensland's economic um, security was measured. We saw 55% of people in um, um, the economy in Southeast Queensland, could have been a little bit more, but 55% was coming from small business. So to strengthen small business and have that flexibility and innovation coming from small business, we had to make sure there were circumstances and an environment where they could bloom and where they could really add value. So our economic security at that time was showing strain because only people, the only people who were getting into small business are people who already owned their houses, their house or houses, and they could take risks. So we were having that sort of risk um, profile back then, but it wasn't enough to be a, um, a major deterrent. I think it's what's happened since might, I might explain a little bit more. But when we look through those other, <clears throat> those other headline indicators, the economy is an important part of all of them. And when we get to natural resource management, that is the natural capital on which we depend for other things to happen. We wouldn't have a tourism industry without our good um, resource management. And soul of the region, of course, is our cultural measures. And we wouldn't be able to have uh, and celebrate our cultures if we weren't in a good 
good economic frame of mind or and definitely our creativity index. Now, we did really well in our tolerance and our um, creativity index back then, and we were quite cohesive when things were going wrong. So the thing is, some of our measures there were quite wonderful. Um, there's quite a few measures under that. So next slide, please. Now, Mike, you might have been part of this um, State of the Region report. I've just taken a tiny bit out of it. And I'm thinking that it really, were you part of that, Mike? Uh, yes, it, it, originally, yes, yeah, was part of this, Mike, you mean? Yes. That, yeah, 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 that's right, yes, yeah. Yeah, so part yeah, of that was, yeah. part of that was quite wonderful. Um, and the work that had gone into it was really quite marvellous across, okay. sorry? Oh, so... I know that it's a little bit to read on the screen for people, but um, it shows a lot of green lights, which means that at that time we were quite comfortable and quite um, um, robust in some of the things we were doing. The only indicator on that at that stage that looked like it was a um, go in the wrong direction was our energy generation. Um, and there was a lot of reform in energy back in those days as well. So we've got to think of the context that these things are going through. So that's really a pretty bloody good report card back in 2008 on those indicators alone. Of course, there were lots and lots. And um, we should be very proud of that when we go benchmark ourselves with other, when we did benchmark with 25 other regions. So uh, next, is that... Have I given enough people enough time to have a look at that? The slides will be available with this as well, of course, and, and it'll be recorded uh, as well. Okay, we're jumping forward a long way now to 2017 because I didn't want to bore you with all the bits in between. But this was an important step forward to be actually able to benchmark ourselves against other city regions around the world and have them and have them at our fingertips. So the red parts are southeast Queensland, whereas the others, so you can see Barcelona is um, uh, the BAR and um, if you can read the bits at the bottom, now these will be available for people. But halfway through, we go from being a leader to a laggard. So when we look at where should we be um, uh, when we're benchmarking, we know that each of these um, regions and cities have very different profiles to what we have in southeast Queensland. But what it means is perhaps we're not as nuanced and sophisticated and could be doing better in some areas. So on that, on that very broad um, benchmarking, um, uh, there's some things we can be very proud of. The ones in the middle are economic, um, but they're all economic when you come when you break down the definition of what economics might be. So, <clears throat> right. So I might just go to the next slide. Now, can anyone see the map? Mm. Okay. Well, I must be on the wrong profile. There, that's better. Okay, so this information is actually plotting from 2016 to 2020, which of course includes um, some droughts, some fires, some, uh, some COVID, some economic downturn, and a whole range of other issues that came across Southeast Queensland. So when we're looking at the um, population, which is really what we're here for, is to consider how we're looking after our people and that the economy is really there to be an engine for, um, <clears throat> and cities are there to be an engine for our development, but also how our quality of life might stack up. So we found that this was a very interesting um, uh, document in our, um, in, a, in, our in our synthesis report that, <clears throat> that shows where we, that orange parts are where we declined during that period, that four year period. But also have a look at Jim Boomba, Pimpama, uh, Caloundra West. And I was being very cheeky when I, um, when I was speaking to um, our, our, our young people, because we meet every week. 
um, <clears throat> I was very cheeky and said, well, perhaps they're the ones that have got the um, um, PDA, priority development areas that weren't necessarily, you know, the whole of SEQ growth was based on scientific evidence and then, and then it was overruled and, and overlaid with other decision-making tools. So when we look at that, we've got to say, why, why had things happened? Well, of course, our workforce changed during COVID as well, and the role of the city, what happened to our urban centres, that, that, um, and they're still happening to our urban centres, really takes us to another argument about what is the role of the city, if it's supposed to be an economic engine room, but as well as that as a social point and an area for, for people to congregate. So, of course, COVID smashed some of those concepts. And then we have to look to the future and say, what exposure do these special parts of, which is risk, world risk reporting methodology, what exposure do we have? So when we look at those parts that are declining, they've all had floods and droughts and, and problems. The susceptibility is the amount of harm that's probably going to happen as a result. Coping capacity is our social resilience, but also our, our infrastructure and our emergency management and our uh, ability to respond quickly and cope. And adaptation is really um, the thing about long-term governance and good decision-making for the future. So when we're when we're looking at a preferred future, we do have to look at these other sorts of risks that overlay what might be, you know, a, a lovely economic formula that the students learn in university. Life is never as simple as university, is it? <laughs> or in senior? Yeah. Okay, so our next slide, please. So Arab in October last year released um, information but we've also got this this lovely map of southeast Queensland on the side so it explains where our urban footprint is it looks at our rural areas because they are now becoming under pressure as far as um, people moving out of the cities people changing the way that they live making decisions about investment where there's no rental rentals just as difficult out of out in our rural areas as well as the city, especially now that we've opened up the borders with COVID, um, after COVID. We also need to balance that with some of the other, the other really important things that we need to, um, to be considerate of when we're doing developments. So that's more than just economic development, that's um, uh, all sorts of... Right, some of the recommendations that came out of Arup's report was <clears throat> where those actions across the top in different colours against how would we look at building our cities or we're doing things with our cities and our neighbourhoods and our catchments differently. So that's a fairly recent report that I, we wanted to share with you because it sort of gives us a bit of a, um, a bit of a, launching pad for our speakers, our panellists to, and it, I mean, economy is very broad and you may wish to define it in your own way. And that's what we'll be asking you to do so that we can get a nice, rich understanding, especially the people who are, who are the students and people who might be um, accessing our recording. Um, so on that, I think I've got one more slide, do I? No, oh, very good. So I guess my role now is to um, introduce our, um, our provocateur, it will be Claire Moore. So thank you, Claire. Uh, Kerry McGovern, people who may have had this um, invitation previously uh, will have a profile for each of these. So I'm going to ad lib. Kerry McGovern, I have an enormous respect for we always ask for people with, from different disciplines to be part of our panel. And I'm so proud of Kerry. Have I embarrassed you enough yet, Kerry? I'm very proud of what she's been able to do as an accountant. She goes into other special developing countries and helps them set up systems and make wiser and better transparency decisions in 
in developing countries and cities and towns in our um, Asia Pacific region, which is the a third of the world, what did we say, from Iraq to Hawaii for Eroff. But as well as that, she's a Brisbane girl, uh, Bundaberg, no, Bow Desert girl. Sorry. Anyway, she's a local girl and she also lives here, even though she's at Geneva some other month and some other place. And that's because we need to acknowledge our wonderful local people who do wonderful things internationally and Kerry's a living legend for that. And you're not even that old yet. So that's our Kerry, uh, Kerry McGovern. The second uh, speaker is Mike Hefferin, and he's a, um, an emeritus professor for both um, Sunshine Coast University and QUT. And he's had a, a long career with um, Queensland government as well as the um, executive director for state development. So he's got a very special uh, background to share with us. He was talking about taxation earlier, so we might even get into that yet. But you're, yeah, you're <laughs> but anyway, we'll, I'm sure as our discussions continue when we chat backwards and forwards that we will get a much better understanding what it's like from on the inside of government in the past when you had to make really hard decisions with a lot of complex information and uh, and how how we, the community, can actually assist, especially in the future with that. And Kerri-Ann Yorman. Kerri-Ann, um, I don't know if you can see the, all of our faces yet. Okay. Kerri-Ann has been crook. I'm sorry, but I'm glad to see that you're better and that you have your voice today. Um, so Kerri-Ann is, um, <clears throat> is the head of urban economics here in um, South East Queensland, but I think she works all sorts of other places and I'm very proud that you've actually got a business that specialises in the sorts of things that you do and you put yourself out there to be an advisor on, and your team and your team because we need that sort of advice when people are making decisions during their lifetime. So I'm really looking forward to what you, uh, your perspectives and what advice you can, recommendations you can give to the community so that we can have a future, a common future that we're all very proud of. So I'll just be quiet now and hand over to Claire. Hello everyone and um, I know that all of our speakers have prepared greatly for this evening so um, basically what I was going to do was to ask each of you um, to just make a contribution about um, how do you think the work that you're doing can contribute to a, a better and more environmentally sound economy for South East Queensland. So uh, just picking um, Kerry if you'd like to kick off how would that go? Oh, we've got two Kerrys. That's a bit distressing, isn't it? Uh, Kerry McGovern. Kerry McGovern, would you like to give your presentation first? And I'm uh, encouraging every speaker to make this more of a conversation than just a, um, a presentation. Right. Thanks very much, Claire, and hello, everybody. Focusing on infrastructure. Um, whoops. We, am I still there? Yeah. Oh, I've just had a message to say Zoom. It Hello? says that, it says that um, something's happening, Kerry, on the screen as though it's waiting for something to contribute. So maybe if you just keep talking and the screen, the um, slides may catch up to you. Are we back? You're back face to face now. Okay, great. Oh, okay, I'll go back. Um, so my focus has been um, mainly on, uh, I come out of Treasury, um, my background, central, central government. The slide has just appeared, Kerry. Great, thanks. Um, so I've, I've tended to focus on infrastructure because that has a, a markedly throw, flow on effect throughout the community. And uh, I want to leave you with a few thoughts at the end. So um, the key points that I'm looking at in terms of the economic well-being um, in South East Queensland is just to reiterate how crucial planning for infrastructure is. Um, and then something that we've, um, um, we've been working on 
is that we found that the capital cost of an infrastructure project, and I know, you know we all know the Russ Hins effect that he could get at least three, three um, um, newspaper articles out of every project, um, but that capital cost is only about 20% of the total cost over its lifetime. So when we think of infrastructure projects, we've got to remember that we're only talking about the fifth and then we've got to find the other um, 80%. And the sorts of outcomes I want to talk about for the region is infrastructure is really about delivering services in a very in a quickly changing environment. And I wanted to talk, leave you thinking about connected biodiversity corridors. So clicking, clicking's not working. Okay, there we go. All right, so in terms of planning for infrastructure. It's really quite complex and there's a lot of strategies and frameworks in place. Now, this is the Queensland government framework. Um, <clears throat> but up, up on this little left-hand box here, you'll see this Infrastructure Australia. And they've got their own um, um, audit plan priority list and their own processes that they go through. So in Australia, it's done at a federal level and they're mainly federal projects, um, but they also impact on state projects and then, of course, local government. So, and then there's the private sector interface as well. So it's really quite a complex plan planning structure. Um, and Southeast Queensland's infrastructure plan is a regional infrastructure plan, and I've highlighted that down there. But I want you to take into consideration that in, even in planning infrastructure in your region, it fits into a larger framework. And it's really crucial to know and understand that framework very well, because it all, it, 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 there are a lot of people working together and they all have to be brought along. Um, if we're going to leave no one behind, it means everybody in the value chain of planning infrastructure as well. How much does infrastructure cost? A recent work that we did for Pacific Island countries, um, looking at um, maintenance mainly was our focus. But what we found is that the construction costs of a project is only about 20% of the total life cycle cost. So it's, it's almost, and I think local governments are finding this, um, the impact of this when we, you get, say a federal government that will provide a project, capital project for a local government, um, but not the operating and maintenance costs. So um, you can get $48 million and think you're doing really well. And, um, and then 185 million you have to find yourself. So, these, these are difficult things. If you spread it out over quite a number of years, hopefully you'll get a long lasting infrastructure out of it, um, which you can reduce it on an annual basis, but you still, this sort of thinking really needs to permeate our, our infrastructure planning, particularly in the changing environment that we're within. Because if, you, if you're building an infrastructure project and a bushfire goes through or a flood goes through and destroys it, well, then that 230, three million cost is over three years, not over 50 years. So that has a huge impact. So what are the basics of planning for infrastructure in Southeast Queensland? So firstly, we've got to look at the priorities for the whole region. And by that, I mean, it's peoples and it's flora and fauna. And we've got to think of it over the long term. So Biodiversity corridors are being built um, throughout southeast Queensland to try and enable flora and fauna to live independently of human settlements. So in order for that, that to be sustainable, we really need to integrate immediate and long-term priorities into our planning framework. And the, the next thing's really important and, and tends to get forgotten a lot because we're really interested in the pipeline of projects. And a lot of the planning for infrastructure is about the pipeline. And what we're not doing, but we're, we're more and more able to do, is look at the whole stock of infrastructure and see where that extra project fits into the stock. Um, see what demand there is for the service that that infrastructure provides and, um, and what it's going to cost to, to operate and maintain. Um, is there a non-infrastructure solution to this need? There are a whole heap of ways, and I know in Queensland's um, uh, iconic really worldwide for dealing with the drought by reducing people's demand for water. That, that, that's a case study now that's used fairly frequently. And you've got to know who's paying for things. So it's all right if the federal government can provide a capital project to a local government, 
But if they're left with a $180 million bill for a $43 million project, um, then you've got to think very carefully about who's going to pay and what value is being added. And is it in terms of cash or is it non-cash value, in which case you can't generate cash to make those payments? So searching for non-infrastructure solutions um, is really important. And for that, you need clearly defined problems and incorporate and getting everybody's input so that the problems are really quite clear um, and not just a simple thing like jobs, 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 which is um, um, tran transient at best. So in the allocation of public investment, it's important to be transparent about the criteria and to publish the process for project selection so people understand and you bring them along. So infrastructure is the services governments provide to them on the planet, even if they're using private sector providers. So, <clears throat> you know, we've got an efficient transport network to move people and goods around the country. We need safe and reliable access to water, drinking water and sanitary services, access to sustainable, reliable energy and efficient movement of goods and produce. And to the right there, you see, here's the map of Southeast Queensland. And what we're trying to do is, is, is put more and more people into this. And it, it's at the expense of the very environment um, on which we depend for our livelihoods. So if we can link up all these dark blue bits to enable flora and fauna to move up and down the ranges and into the sea, down the waterways, um, that will improve the livability of the whole area. Questions or discussions? I assume that'll be left for later. Um, yes, Kerry, thank you very much because you touched on a number of issues there, including um, what the outcome should seek. So we'll go back to that after the other two speakers have gone, have had their chance so we can look at what outcomes we're all seeking out of this process and how we can bring the community with us. So Mike, following on from sure. Kerry, um, in terms of the work that you're doing and also your definition and um, expectation of what would be economic well-being in South sure. East Happy to, Claire, and I'll move quickly because we want to get to the discussion too. But look, um, I guess the first thing <laughs> goes way back, and that is that when we discuss things like this here, it's like uh, economics is a different planet, you know, and, and it really isn't. I mean, the, the term is, is the old <laughs> economists in the room or in the discussion, remember, it means, it doesn't mean finance, but finance and Keynes and all that ran, ran away with it. It means rules of the house. It means how we run things and how we organise things and how we get to efficiency and those sort of things. And I think that one of our issues now is we face a really complex, heavens, that's not the word, time, and we've got all this growth in South East Queensland and all these sort of things. We, we keep coming to this divide between a financial sector, which is supposed to work for us, um, and a, a physical sector. And, and again, one of that to be a blinding change is long since dead. But you know, suddenly economics became about aggregates, about you know, this sector and that sector and the development sector and all that sort of stuff. Whereas all, all of us, all of the community out there, don't live in a sector, they live in, in a place and, and, and in a, a, a village or a town or a suburb and all that sort of stuff. And I suspect, and this sounds a bit whimsical, but um, it's really not as complex as we might think. I mean, if, if we're either happy, and there's that the happy word, um, or not, based often on very, very fundamental things. And if those fundamental things are met, then we're un unhappy. And um, I remember Ted O'Brien uh, up here on the Sunshine Coast, by the way, um, and, and the university did a lot of work uh, thinking about this sort of stuff. Um, and let's try to find a word that we can all agree with. And, and like, it's not resilience. You know, we hear that a lot, and I'm still not quite sure. Um, and we hear 
you know, the debate between development and, and the environment and all this sort of stuff. And when you came through all these sectors that we talked about right through from school kids and, and all, or through business and, and the university and all that, I mean, I, I know it sounds a bit corny, but the word we came up with was healthy. That if you start saying, um, oh, look, we're pro-development or anti-development or we want to save, you know, koalas or whatever, you can immediately set up a friction. But, you know, an overlapping word uh, being uh, health is something that, you know, and how do you define that? So, you know, mm, on, on. Mm. But, but it's this common thread that I don't care who you are, um, if you say, do you want a healthy dot, 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 that's a, 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 an absolute word. And it includes physical health and the whole shooting match. So if we start off from that, uh, and from a very local base, you know, as I said before, pe people live locally and, and they vote locally and, they, you know, when it's all boiled down. Um, and, and that's where we've got to sort of build things up uh, from, from there, I believe. So, um, and the, the building blocks of that are not necessarily uh, too different. But you mentioned before about tax. I mean, ever since that's a miserable debate by both sides, sorry, Claire, <laughs> in this last election, I was on housing. What absolute rubbish. They never got to the, the, the soul of it. And um, you can use tax to incentivise people, and it doesn't take a lot to, to, to lead it one way. And, and uh, I, I just wish that debate would come back. Anyway, I'm getting off the sad box now because other people are going to speak. <laughs> Thanks, Brian. Like yeah. I think you, uh, you might upset a lot of our econ economic <laughs> masters who say that when you say it should be simple, you know, um, yeah, I think yeah. there's been a lot of mythology built up about how complex economics yeah, is. Yeah, it's, so, it's... Kerry Ann, I saw you nodding a lot then when Mike was speaking. So we'll move on to you. How, how do you see the work you're doing and how it would be able to work with in making a better um, economy and habitat for us? Sure, and I, I think it was quite interesting that um, the topic today around urban economics, that's my company's name is Urban Economics. So, you know, we, <laughs> we live, work, play, breathe this space on a day-to-day -day basis, I guess. But when I was thinking about, you know, we all, and, and, you know, I agree with what you're saying there, Mike, in terms of, I, I, I think that's a really good analogy to talk about economy in terms of health. And I think we all have our own definitions about what economics is or the economy is to us and to each of us and how we relate to the world, you know, whether it's our local neighbourhood, whether it's southeast Queensland or broader, um, you know, our region, our, our state, our, our world in which we live in, work and, and play in. Um, and and I, I took... Um, you know, and, and even just thinking about today and, and the broad, broad definitions about what, you know, economics could be or um, economic well-being is. And the one that I really like the most, I, I think is probably, uh, and it's a stat statisticians one, but the ABS has a, a definition that you it uses for economic well-being. And this, again, this is, I guess, how we apply our consulting to, or I'd like to think our team applies consulting to um, the way in which we add value to Southeast Queensland. Talking about, and it, it from the ABS considers it's from the perspective of families and households, but I think it does mm -hmm. apply um, from, a, from a region. We can apply it to Southeast Queensland generally. And it talks about um, measuring the resources that families or households or individuals have at their disposal to support their material living conditions and what they want out of their life. And I think more importantly, it then goes on to say, and how it can, they can, can and what their control is over them. So you know, I think that control comes in very significantly from when we're thinking about planning um, for Southeast Queensland as a region as we grow, um, the mechanisms that, that we might necessarily have as an individual don't necessarily relate to, um, or don't, we don't necessarily think we can apply them for planning for Southeast Queensland, but they're really the same sort of elements. When we think about, um, you know, there's so many metrics that we think about when we're, we're thinking about what success means to us or what does our economic well-being to us as individuals. It might be that I have a job or 
um, on earning and income, but it also, it, it's about, well, what that employment means and how I'm contributing to my community or contributing to my society, or it might be the volunteering that I'm undertaking that is contributing to that society. And it's also my access. How are we accessing goods and services here in Southeast Queensland? And, and what is it? Is that relating to the social infrastructure that's in place, the public transport that's in place, or is it I can live, work, learn, play in the environments that I want to do? So I guess, you know, just wanting to start the conversation there in terms of that's how we're relating to um, Southeast Queensland and our role in it. Um, and, and how we, we work with councils and private developers and, and not-for-profits in, I guess, adding value to their communities and, and uh, how we all uh, play within those communities. Right. In terms of the, the next round of questioning, it leads straight on from that because it's about outcomes and how we bring the community along with us. And I think each of you have touched on that to an extent um, in your original contributions. But if we can actually get um, some feedback now, particularly about um, we want a healthy environment, we want a healthy society. You mean that wonderful Joan Kerner quote, um, we live in a society, not an economy, which um, I treasure, um, and it's along that process. But, um, Kerry, if we go back to you, are you, your presentation listed a number of outcomes that you were seeking. How do you see how we actually bring the community along with us? So it's not um, being told what should happen. It's agreeing as a community what must happen. Well, <clears throat> I think the blockages aren't so much within the community because I think when you go into local community groups, there's dozens and hundreds of local community groups, environmental groups, walking groups, all sorts that are trying to maintain the community. There's your chambers of commerce, et cetera, that are trying to keep the economy going and often the membership of these um, mixes. I think the biggest block we have is, is, is when I showed you that um, you know, the schema for infrastructure planning um, and for planning, that the planning laws or the planning rules that we have are actually tripping us up. Um, is it injurious affection? Um, the, the requirement that, that, that there has to be um, compensation provided that is not just compensation that the community is happy to provide, but that somebody wants to still get the money out of the land that they had even though they've no longer got it so these sorts of principles are really blocking a lot of the community cooperation that's happening um, so as I said earlier with that slide on the planning process all of those all of those different processes in planning from infrastructure Australia to the state planning all the way through to local government planning and and business planning are all populated by people. And I think it's, it's actually reaching out to all of those people and having them involved. Um, one, one of the big learnings I had when I was working in New Zealand was that it was never an issue to fight for the environment in New Zealand because everyone around the table went tramping every weekend. Like the whole of the public service was out in the environment on the weekend. So you didn't have to fight to maintain forests or rivers, etc., cetera. Um, there might, this was some time ago, I know there's been a lot um, of debate recently about um, pollution of rivers, etc., in New Zealand, but where you've got your public servants who are deeply involved in the environment, um, you, you're going to cut through a lot of what could otherwise be intellectual opposition because people are trained to do one thing. And if you've got a lot of um, silo thinking along the way, um, that's going to make it very difficult. So somehow you have to connect that up and it's best to do it at the human level rather than at the organisational bu or bureaucratic level. Okay. Mike, um, I actually found most public servants in Canberra seem to go skiing, so I don't know whether that translates. <laughs> it was always my personal experience when I was in the public service when you wanted to speak to someone in Canberra. They're always skiing. Um, in terms of what Kerry was saying, do you um, follow that same model? Yes, that, absolutely. Like how we build it together? 
I, I just wish they'd go skiing more often, but that's, <laughs> that's a state bureaucrat talking about the column. Hey, I, I'd really like to pick up to, and I go quickly on, on what Kerry just said, because it's exactly right. It, what governments do invariably is they overestimate their importance in some areas and they underestimate in the others. And their answer to everything is, hey, look, let's throw some rules at this. And because of property and development and, and all that sort of stuff, it's too complex if you go down. So back to an old economist, Hayek, he said, let's put the rules, the boundaries in place and make them quite tough that nobody goes outside that if it's about uh, uh, you know, green belts or whatever. And then after that, if you're going to have a capitalist economy, we'll have one. You know, so, so strict rules of the game and just let them get on with it because there's, and just use incentives and penalties, you know, like <laughs> capital gains, which we just sort of threw out the door. Mm -hmm. um, and, and the last thing I would say is exemplification. If you can get, you know, a, 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 and it's not that hard to do because we've got some really good and big firms around, development companies and whatever, and, and you get, government and and they a formula that works right down to building design if you want that and just say hey here folks here's how to make a quid out of this and have a rails run on regulations you you watch them line up for that, that, that that's what they want because at the end of the day they want money and that's there's been a couple mm. of economy there's nothing wrong with that but you know you've got to make it easy for the good ones to get ahead and the, the not so good to be sent into the wilderness a bit. So, okay, hey, Kerry Ann, how do you feel about that? How do you, you know, balance the good? How do you in incentivize the good and restrict the not so good? I think I'll probably explain that, Claire, in a couple of, you know, examples. For for example, I've got a um a client who is absolutely passionate about trying to. Um, establish a fantastic network of um, mental health facilities. And we know we have a, a crying mm. out, uh, absolutely uh, a pandemic in, yep. um, in mental health here in Australia. And it's basically a fail, waiting for the system to continue to fail so mm. that property development can come in and bring the solutions. But mm. um, there are too many regulations in place um, that, you know, a mental health facility doesn't, you know, some residential care doesn't have to be a hospital, for example, um, but planning authorities consider it as a hospital. So that's one example. So there are viable solutions and innovative solutions that the private sector and the not-for-profit sector are coming up with, but they're being hampered and stymied by, you know, good, what has been good in the past planning systems, but we need to be a lot more innovative in, in our planning. And the other example is, you know, when we talk about resilience, and I know, you know, we, we mentioned earlier that resilience isn't necessarily the word we want but mm. um but it's such you know. a good word, <laughs> such a good word. <laughs> well, yeah and and for example you know the the recent floods here in 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 southeast queensland and in brisbane we've had you know the the trauma and the devastation mm. for mm. families um but also for businesses you know and, and i've had clients going to local authorities and saying look i've got the solution i want to um you know fill the land build the land up but I have to be able to put something different on the land than just traditional industrial, for example. So I need to be able to, I've got a viable solution, but the planning mechanisms don't allow those viable solutions yep. for real jobs to come to play, for people to then be able to have access to jobs close to their community. So again, it comes back to me to, you know, I've got some really innovative um, developers and clients and, and people out there wanting to do things that are, give resilience that are contr contributing to wealth creation here in Southeast Queensland in a sustainable manner. And most importantly, which is something I'm so passionate about is that we have, and I've said a number of times today, you know, opportunities to live, work, play and learn within our local areas. You know, we mm. don't only have to go to the CBD to do that or, you know, one particular location to do that, that we've got that available to us. And, and that to me is, is critical and and you know I've done some work with um suburban futures before and we were looking and one of the pieces of work that they did was to sort of say well where is all the investment happening in in um, sort of the greater Brisbane area and 
10 to 1, I think it was happening in, in the inner city area compared to elsewhere. So again, another failing of our, our system. And we need, in bringing the community along, they want to see that, yes, my community is being invested in more broadly rather than mm. just only the city centre. Okay. We've got a couple of questions in the chat, but before we go there, and I'll pass over to Danelle for that, I've got one question that leads on from all your contributions, and that is you've identified that the system we have is providing restriction and that um, there, has, there needs to be a more innovative uh, way of looking at it and weighing it up. How do you do that? In 20 seconds, um, we start with you, Kerry, and then go around because I think that's been a common element on all um, your presentations that there's will, there's ideas, there's agreement. You know, the issue around mental illness and mental health, everybody at every level knows we have to do better there, but the system's not letting it happen. Any suggestions for how you actually change the system? Um, Kerry, well, political, Kerry, political will is crucial. Yes. And um, um, I see a lot of politicians being hogtied by um, vested interest groups. And somehow we have to um, support our politicians better mm. so that they can do the job they really want to do. Okay. That, that probably would be a really good T-shirt, Kerry. Support our politicians. <laughs> um, Mike. Yeah, and just briefly, um, I, I think that um, as regards infrastructure, which is always the bane of everybody's life, I mean, we've got to come back to betterment taxes, you know, and, and uh, areas that um, are being supported by the, by pu the public per, per purse, which uh, benefit only some, you know, and there's ways to do that. That's been done for, for over 100 years. But I think if we started doing that to, to balance things off, so that, that's yeah. one, one start, yeah. Okay. Carry on. And, and continuing on, I guess, with that sort of theme, you know, if, if we've got a new regional plan that's coming for South East Queensland, we have to tie our infrastructure strategies to the regional plan um, and we have to be able to see that communities and communities need to be able to see where the funding is going to provide that infrastructure um, soft and hard infrastructure for their um, local communities. Yep. And that is communication, how we communicate this. Absolutely. These, people are they're not fearful of it. They actually want to be engaged. Yep. Um, Danelle, I think it's my turn to hand over to you to look at some of the questions that have come up um, from the chat. Yes, I have about six of my own, but I'll, I'll but, just shelve them for a moment. There's um, one that intrigues me, but, you know, we'll see what else people have got. What was that one that you had there about, um, I'm trying oh, to see. There's a oh, deprivation index rather than some of the, you know, how much money comes in here and I've got six kids versus how much money comes into the house and there's no children. The deprivation index. And how index. about what is injurious affection? Yeah, it I sounds think, like it sounds like a whole different discussion to me. Injurious I, affection. I would like Kerry to explain that more because that's where we come unstuck. So, please, Kerry, Kerry McGovern, could you just explain that to people, please? Oh, I think I'm at the stage of Google it, mate. <laughs> no, because not all of our states have got injurious affection. What well, it means well, is well, Queensland's Planning Act has, yeah, and it's um, yeah, go on, Danelle. So that's probably the biggest blockage because it colours decision making so badly and not in the community favour. The community has to pay if the if the local government loses a case in the planning environment court because of it. The, the community has to pay the developer and then oh the community rates have to pay if other things happen so the thing is we are the bunnies the community the residents left standing we're the bunnies who pick up the the slack from all of that so you know if that's our biggest blockage and why decision people are so frightened and risk averse about decision making i really think we should be um the other states have removed it i think we should be having a, a dedicated effort to get rid of that but that is what my argument was supposed to be but only that it's so important I don't think people realize now people like um, Howard Briggs has had 30 years of experience in this and and um, having to cope um, with that but um, 
So that's that, maybe one of the recommendations we could put in the Slido. And I'd encourage people to duck over to Slido over in our chat box and answer our second lot of questions there while we're talking and asking questions. So I'll definitely be putting things about the um, uh, injurious affection in there because I do. it was the big blockage that was the elephant in the room that we really, um, I hadn't really visited for a little while. Yeah. Mike, have you been trying to get in there for oh, a no, while? No, no, just, just one second. I absolutely agree that injurious affection and the way it's defined I mean, it's been in the legislation for years and years and years, and every other state has moved on. Um, as long as it's there, I mean, all the courts are doing are interpreting and on, on both in the legislation and on precedent, mm -hmm. and you're going to get hit with this all the time. So unless there's a really big rethink on, you know, on injurious affection, uh, not, not the town planning stuff that, that as such, but, but no. in, in the wider sense of it, it, it'll keep coming back. You, you get the, when they say you've got the same, the same coil, they'll sing, they'll sing the same hymns to you. And that's mm -hmm. what's happening. Well, well, Mike, could you help a small team after this for us to actually have a campaign how to get rid of it? It's oh. been around 100 years and it's not yeah. serving us now. That's right. Happy to. And a lot of it comes back to English law. That's how far back it goes. Yeah. It's yeah. Incredible. Yeah. yeah, the elephant in the room. Now, Anthony, Ob um, Anthony, would you like to answer, ask your question? Your hand's been up a long, long time. Yes. Anthony? Good morning, everybody. Good morning. Uh, afternoon. Oh, okay. Here in Nigeria, Africa, it's actually morning, 7 a.m. So I, I, I've learned a lot from how this city in Australia have done. And I, I believe the UN actually holds this for us, other developing cities to actually learn from where you guys are headed. Just before I ask my question, I would just like to chip in some recommendation to Miss Kerry. Mm -hmm. In as much as we understand how innovation and how things have modern innovations have actually changed the structure and the, the, the city itself being an engine of development who actually should be sensitive to the way we want to change orthodox planning things. Remember that we, within this 21st century, we are fighting so hard for, for global warming. And when you tend to infuriate suburb, uh, urban, if you rate rural areas with urban and characters, let's say industries, and you want to get human that comfort they need, you live and work, you also bring, bring this these activities that are like in the forefront of global warming. There's no way yeah. the development, although I know has gone beyond manufacturing to service and all that, but remember that cities are also centers for global warming. So let's be, be sensitive to the way we want to change our orthodox planning system because we might not want to agree now but it does serve for some purpose that are very vital to the environment that's just um, a recommendation but for my question i would like to to know if there's a an advice from your city advice from you guys to us within this side of, of the world, especially Africa, because with, with all you've, 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 you've gone through, let's even today, I, I got to learn that in infrastructural projects, that the cost that the government actually bear is actually 20%. I never knew that. I, I thought in Africa, what we hear our government do is infrastructure, infrastructure. And when you look well, you tend to see plenty projects being done and the maintenance becomes an issue. So yeah. what, what methods have you used in getting all these projects when it's done to work? I, I knew you were trying to say something about taxation and how it has worked for you. That's one. And another is in terms of um, this development. I've always been against the UN in this regard, like most of the strategies and most of the the system, most of the planning concepts you 
actually advise Africans to use, uh, to my knowledge and to the research I've done, non-working. It doesn't really suit us as a nation. It doesn't really work for us. Are there things that you know that you feel that are peculiar to you, to your planning methods in in Australia that we could see as an inference to adopting like your planning strategies here? That's just <laughs> I, I was um, Anthony, have you had a look at what they're doing in South Africa? They're doing some really interesting planning work. They're trying to de apart. Uh, um, um, apartheid yeah. South Africa because of the planning the planning of South Africa was Im embedded in apartheid spatially and what they're doing is unpicking that now and they've got a um, um, a goal of everyone lives 20 minutes from work I really recommend if you have a look at the planning in South Africa it's really really interesting yes I if I'm keeping <clears throat> I, I, I have actually, and I did some, I did like last year in 2020, I did some research work about the SDG and the Millennium Development Goal, which I submitted to the UN. Uh, unfortunately, I have not gotten any feedback. It, it, it is because we, we shouldn't forget the, the, the parts technological innovations play in most of these planning strategies and ideas we like that like South Africa, we might not want to agree, are way ahead of most of, most of us African countries within innovation and technological development. That's just our problem. Anthony, are you in Abuja or Lagos? Yes, I am. Yes, okay. I'm in Abuja. Okay, well, um, I, I should <clears throat> move on with, um, there's quite a few things that the speakers have spoken about today. We might be speaking different language, meaning regenerative cities and nature-based solutions, which you don't um, speak in that way uh, in Abuja. So, it, you know, we're talking about the same sorts of outcomes. We just use different words uh, because, um, you know, where we are, we have six cities and 47 urban centres and 137 towns in this little region. So we're just like a, a big Abuja, but we're not under one name. We're a network of uh, villages and communities and, and cities. Some of them are better, better looked after than others. And that's what we're, this inequity that, uh, that we are finding as well. So we've got some issues that we need to address, but when we're talking as a region as a whole, we can resolve issues across all of them by having better understanding of how we implement. Like the green corridors can look after five shires or, or um, five regional councils. So, you know, we can um, do things that are actually um, strategic and regionally significant in a good way. And Abuja can do that as well because it's got such a big uh, footprint. But I think we should, um, um, and please stay on for our virtual pub later uh, when we don't record everything. So um, <clears throat> I'd better go to some of the other questions. Um, uh, oh, wow. Thank you, everybody who's using the chat box. And I encourage you to use Slido, especially you, Anthony. I want you to, to put your comments and things in the Slido. Do you know how to get into that, everybody? Good. Uh, <clears throat> I'm just looking at our, our questions and we might have a QA and a at the bottom as well. Right. Um, <clears throat> Oh, three more messages. Okay. Um, <clears throat> I'd like to open up, and especially to you, Howard, about um, over the last 30 years, we've had some major, major successes and recently some major failings. So um, <clears throat> some of the things that we're talking about aren't new. What we're asking to put in place, we've put in place previously and it worked for like 12 years um, or four years. And uh, um, <clears throat> are there questions that you would like to ask Howard because of your experience? Well, I'm sorry, I, I came in. Oh. Okay. Uh, 
Better get my microphone going. Can you hear me? Yes. I can. Yes. Oh, that's good. I thought I'd have my earphones on. Okay. Um, I'm not a CrossFit as much as I'd like to be at present, but some quick comments about injurious affection because I was involved in the um, working group that changed the rules that existed in the past. They were changed in the um, 19... Uh, 97 um, IPA legislation, mm -hmm. where it was automatic that you got injurious affection if something got knocked back where um, somebody would normally have been approved under the planning scheme. And it was it was very restrictive. Uh, at that time, what happened was that a, a local government could change the planning scheme and uh, to address uh, shortcomings in the old scheme, in other words, down zone land uh, and provided a person um, put an application in with a given period of time, a company it was, might have been five years, I can't recall exact details. Unless they uh, put in within five years, they lost the right to have injurious affection. So there was an attempt to mm -hmm. remedy some of the failing, failings in the past. So while there's a need to change this, I think that it gets right complicated when people see that they've got an existing right and the right's been removed arbitrarily by, by a local government. So there's an issue there that you need to look at. But in terms of um, my experience with working with planners that is that they're fairly unaware or choose to be unaware of how some of the features that are, have been addressed through a planning scheme, in fact, are transported into a development application and approval. Uh, I, my experience is that most planners seem to plan quite well. It's how it's then translated into action when dealing with the development, the problem arises. Mm -hmm. And I, I recall um, back in my way back in 1997, being in a forum that PIA were running mm -hmm. and one speaker spoke on planning and he did a good job. Another speaker spoke about development applications. And I asked the question to John Braddock at that time, how come the two speakers were talking about different things that weren't linked? And that still exists. And, and mm. the, the legislation has been organised to give enormous amount of discretion to actually overrule things that are in the planning schemes when a development application comes in without being quite explicit on the, what conditions uh, the planning scheme can be um, uh, overturned or ignored. And that's the issue that needs to be addressed. It's about the level of discretion and it's also about the, the level of expertise that town planners have when making a determination because they're very competent at dealing with engineering and architectural issues, but they are fairly blind on dealing with context issues where the environment's involved. Yeah. And most of those issues were addressed during the planning scheme development, but they're, the, the people doing the development assessment are fairly ignorant of this when they come down to making a development application approval. And that's where the problem really lies. I tried way back quite a few years ago now to have a meeting between members of the um, people who are involved in natural resource planning type areas mm -hmm. and the town planners to talk about educational levels at training they get at universities. And I think that's really a fundamental issue. We need to, they're not stupid, just that they're, they're unaware of what they're dealing with. And, yeah. and, and there's a great reluctance to bring about further changes in the Planning Act because it means they've got to learn new things and it's made, made more complicated for them. So we've now gotten a situation where people are making decisions relying upon protection under regulations which aren't fit for purpose. Yeah. 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 I don't know if that's been very helpful. That's why yeah. you know the world. Okay. Well, sometimes we can learn from our from our past. Um, the thing is, when we found things that actually work, why don't why do the wheels fall off? We had a southeast Queensland regional plan. We had twelve policies. By the time three years had passed, those twelve policies only three were funded through the budget. So even though the SEQ regional plan at that time was was a, a legal instrument. Um, not all of it followed through, turned into programs, turned into 
money and turned into staffing and implementation. So the thing is that you can have a wonderful system and the, the wheels still fall off. And I guess that's the role of community to whinge about those nine bits that weren't looked after. So, well, yeah. Danelle, uh, uh, like moving on from what Howard's saying, <laughs> working with planners, I find that they're financially illiterate. Yes. You know, they, I, I provide them with a financial statement and they can't even read it. So, you know, they're making these decisions independently of the resource allocation and the resources that are available. So I love Howard's view of getting the Treasury people and the environmental people. I mean, that's what EROF does. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, the Eastern Regional Organisation for Planning and Human Settlements, which, um, <clears throat> which I'm from, um, what we're doing is we're bringing together all the different sectors and all levels of government um, because, like, when you talk to a, an architect, he talks in pictures. I talk in numbers. <laughs> so you've got this mismatch that's going on and at least in ear off you can actually think, what the hell are you talking about you know and then get it drawing out and, and show me and then you realize the difficulties you have in communicating across the different professions yeah yeah you know words mean same word different thing it's like region you know when you're talking about a water engineer region means watershed area and if you're talking to a football fan it means a completely different thing so you've got the same words that mean completely different things and could, could i just add to that thank yep. you but, uh, what we have here with development control in South East Queensland, which is so critical given the growth, is mm. the worst of both worlds because we've got too, too, too much, too little sort of, of that strategic look and it tumbles down very quickly. Hey, let's get more regulations. We think of where, where perhaps it was coming from. Um, yep. If I could draw a parallel very quickly, if you look at compuls compulsory acquisition, you know, resumptions, that, that there, you look at that legislation, it, 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 there's just the core elements of it. And then they say, hey, look, you guys and girls, get on with these the rules, here's the precedent, go to court if you need to. But over the years, very, very few cases now go to court because between the professionals, it's right. And, and the, the way the system in development has gone is there's no such thing as a, a brave, uh, uh, what would say, uh, planner in a council because there's very little room. Here's the rules, tick, yep. go, no rules, go away. So, yeah. And then I'm when there are rules, I guess, I guess we'll just put conditions on an approval. So I'm even fine. when we don't have the word prohibit in our legislation anymore. I, Sorry. I'm, unfortunately, the rules are used to, to overcome ignorance. Yes. Oh, you comply with the rules. It doesn't matter whether the rules are inappropriate. I can give plenty of examples of this, but one thing that really concerned me was that there was a major development at, at, um, at just near Swan Road where there was a proposal to have a, a, a nursing home go in. And I've got a cousin who well, did it. She's now since died in the last fortnight. Mm -hmm. But I, I had frequent visits to nursing homes and I know it basically is required a nursing home. And I put a submission in with two doctors who are specialists dealing with healthcare on the code for nursing homes and all the comments you made were ignored mm. because the decision was already being made on architectural and, and um, uh, engineering type design things and nothing yeah. to deal with the, what you need to do to have people living in that area. Mm. Those things were completely dismissed and it really horrified me. And we looked at the responses back. They didn't even try to explain it. They said, this is not relevant. So there's a, a problem with people understanding what they don't know. Yeah. We, we used to call them the abominable no men. You know, it was just sort of no, no, no. That, 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 <laughs> that, 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 there was no, no, no fear in say, saying no to it. Yeah. Okay. I'm going to encourage people to be able to click onto that second Slido question, and that says... Um, what is your contribution here? What does economic well-being look like for SEQ? So I think we've talked around and around, but everyone like yours might be a code for nursing homes. Other people will have a special burning in their belly about what the um, well-being, economic well-being will look like. So I'm encouraging you now to take a, a moment to just do that, including you, Claire, because she has some incisive um, um, 
clangers sometimes that just just uh, are amazing. Um, <clears throat> uh, right, we've got a few other things here about interdisciplinary innovation in decision making. How do you think we can do that in Southeast Queensland? We've only got a few more minutes before we go to. How do you think we can get more people at the table? We used to do community plans because it was a um, it was um, under the local governments. They are required to listen to the community before they did their strategic and corporate plannings. Now, in 2012, that disappeared um, or dissolved or only two of our 10 regional councils actually talk about a community plan now. So the thing is, we need to consider how can we get more interdisciplinary dialogue, given that we don't have the opportunities for public participation like we had possibly 18 years ago. Uh, Donnell, just one suggestion there. Um, Hugh Lavery was involved in a community reference group experience in in the North Shore of Sydney. And yes. it's useful to refer to what experience he's had and how it operated and, and why it failed. Because I think there is an opportunity through learning from those, those experiences. Also, um, I know that, and even though I'm not a member, SEQ Community Alliance are planning a workshop in October this year to try to form a bridge between the various players in looking at planning within Southeast Queensland. Mm. Yeah, yeah, and Friends of SEQ, of course, had a very broad brief, and that was 20 years ago, and we, we just in, evolved into that SEQ CA, but its principles have completely changed. But when you've got new people with new blood, it has to evolve. So, you know, you've got to let things evolve. So where we could be quite purist, I don't think, um, and I don't think that we had 8 eight eights opportunity to, for participation uh, 18 years ago. So we had many bites of the cherry. We were invited to the table every two months. We were invited to strategic liaison groups. We were proactive in the way that we would look at draft, um, draft planning rules and things like that. The community is not involved like that at the moment. So I guess if that was a time when we felt quite empowered, perhaps it's time to, to reintroduce systems to do so. But um, Claire might have some ideas because she's been on the other end of um, making sure that the community um, contributes to her inquiries and things. So, Claire, you've been asking questions, but would you like to be a contributor? I can't hear you. Got to open up. Certainly, every, my view about the um, parliamentary committees is well known. I think that we get more value out of parliamentary committees than any other element of the parliament. Oh. And as long as the politicians involved understand that parliamentary committees are there for the people and the community to talk rather than them, um, you can come up with some very, very good information. And I am constantly... Um, amazed and pleased by the engagement which um, individual people and groups show in wanting to be involved in these um, in these processes but um, I think as a number of the participants this afternoon have said if you continually do that and feed ideas in and then constantly get knocked back with flat nose or just dismissal we're going to lose that engagement and that would be the saddest element and that's what we've got to fight against. So we're coming back to the one-eighth that we're allowed to use right now. That one-eighth is being undermined as well. So our last eighth of participation now is when we have um, uh, public petitions or inquiries where we can uh, contribute at the 11th hour. However, some of the ministers have never seen the, the contributions of the people with public petitions. So... You can do a ticker box or you can do a, a, a written uh, report on that. But we find that that's not a very effective way either. So our eighth, eighth, our last eighth of the door for community to feel like we're empowered to do something about the future through the legals, the, the legislative arm uh, or the judicial arm um, is, is lost and the executive arm. We, we've lost so, you know, we're scratching at the pole, at the door outside at the moment. 
So, Mike, given you your experience, and Kerry, I think you wanted to say something. Kerry Ann also wanted to say something. Well, I should give opportunity for Kerry Ann to respond. Yeah. Sure. I, I think just following on from that, Donald, that, that you know, this so often, you know, we have opportunities as business groups, as professional organisations, as community to have input to, you know, strategic plans, uh, you know, um, at both the state and local government level. Uh, for example, you know, one that comes to mind, you know, the, the recent um, draft industry strategy from Brisbane City Council, a range of different documents, but more often than not, you know, what 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 does the community feel that they get heard in those? What What is the reference back to them you know can you can you actually see any difference from a draft to a final rarely um and so you know you get tired of making submissions or you know participating in in, in community or stakeholder reference groups for these various planning documents and so forth when you feel like there's just not, not going to be any input back to you or you know is, is your opinion or is your group that you're um uh, you know, championing or, or um, representing actually being heard. Well, that's why we're trying to have four ways of input for people today. Um, Mike, I'd like to... Uh, yeah, just a couple of bits on that. Uh, first of all, I mean, the politicians are in charge as they should be. And so <laughs> to get... <laughs> I'm being diplomatic, Claire. <laughs> um, but what happens so often is that stuff that gets fed through to them when policy is being developed, it's really hard for them to say, by the time they get to it, it's hard mm. to say, no, that's not right. We don't want to do that. So what do you do about that? I, I think the professional bodies have got a, a, a role. I, I hear that argument about uh, town planners so often. But I just wonder if, the, if the, the institute are really aware of that and want to train their people to be wider. But you've got to get to things, before, I think what I'm trying to say, you've got to get to things before they get on the minister's desk or the momentum mm -hmm. is up for them because it's just a, a, a runaway train after that. And even though people, as Kerry was saying, put in really good reports, it's so hard, as inside the departments, it is so hard by then for somebody to say, oh, they came up with a better idea. Now, they'll do that a little bit, but it's, it's very hard for them to do that. So I think just two, those two things is get in early, get to the politicians as best one can, but, but the, often the professional bodies are, are really helpful in that. Yeah. Well, I guess that's what we were invented for, is to give us a backbone and to mm. have a backbone. We're supposed to be professionals and we're supposed to be informative and, 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 and leading legislation and those sorts of things. So we're supposed to, that's our role, and NGOs are similar. Mm. So, okay. Right. Howard. Uh, I'd like to make a quick comment, and that is that I tried two years ago to have PIA invite a person from the community that may have an informed opinion rather than a prejudiced opinion to come along to relevant EI, uh, PIA uh, forums where there may be something that they can contribute and learn from the PIA people as well. And that never got taken up. I'm in the process of trying to negotiate a, a meeting with, with the um, president of the PIA. I'm not optimistic, this is Queensland, mm -hmm. because I've actually spoken to my local councillor and he's prepared to pay for people from the community to attend some of these forums that are relevant so they can actually contribute the views of the community. So the community isn't required to pick up the tab themselves. Now, I'm trying to get something like that going and that's what I'm doing as an individual. Um, I think that um, it's, it's the, the really the issue is that the People in the planning area don't, re or in the development assessment area, don't believe it's important to go beyond what's required in legislation. They yeah. say that they, they'll brief their minister to say that's not relevant, and the minister will take it at face, face value, and that's part of the problem. So, and I have looked just recently at, this is the last week, at a curiosity, a development application going in for, um, 
for a steward home. Now, that seems like a reasonable place. They're trying to make a new development for playing fields. Mm -hmm. And I thought out of curiosity, I'd have a look at their impact assessment document. 331 pages. Now, how can the community contribute in a meaningful way when that's the sort of stuff they get led fed? And when I had looked through it, the majority of it was about legislative requirements, what are the various acts involved? And this, most people in the community glazes over. When you look at the bit about conclusions, it's, it's very sparse and very limited. So that's why we have a problem with the community participating because we get all this stuff which is not relevant to them. When I got involved in the first SEQ regional plan, I went to QFF and said, this plan, when it comes out, it's going to have a major impact upon rural people. And QFF said, no, it won't. And I said, I'll give you a one-page summary of what the first draft plan, which was purely urban-oriented, will have upon rural people. Mm. I gave them a one-page statement instead of the 100-page draft plan, and I got employed because they could understand what was happening. Yeah. Normally, they couldn't understand because they got a lot of words which mean, didn't mean anything to them. Yeah. So it's about communication and clarity is critical. Well, on that topic, I'd like to ask Merva, are you the teacher librarian who's been in the chat box? Merva? Are you there, Merva? Yes, I am. Yes, yes. Would you like to share with us what, um, or maybe your daughter's dobbed you in? But... Oh, she has. Look, some of the things that have come going through my mind, I recall, you know, years gone by, I've, I've been retired for a couple of years now, and I know the, the curriculum has changed in recent times. But I do recall um, a lot of student work with, in particular in geography, senior geography, um, looking at those plans and what they, you know, implications for the, the local community around um, Indrapilly where I taught. Um, um, look, I would think from the experience of the last weekend, this, I hope a lot more young in, interest of young people in politics and their local scene. Um, you know, picking that up, we don't get support from our newspaper, but there's a whole lot of other ways of getting to young people and, and getting others involved. Um, you know, the Geography Teachers Association would come to mind. Um, I know there hasn't you know, it, some of, Hasn't it just folded two years ago? I don't know. I'm sorry. I don't know that. Um, it may have. Well, that says something too, doesn't it? Well, um, okay. Yes, yeah, so they were part. They were uh, corporate members of Friends of SEQ, and I do keep in touch with them, oh and they gosh. want to resurrect. Right. Okay. Um, so look, I'm a little bit out of touch there. Apologies there, but I really would have thought that the, there would be a lot of interest, young people, university students. I mean, people, the students who are going into that planning area. Um, you know, you, you miss the information that used to come through the throw over the fence newspapers. Um, you know, it was one way of finding out what was going on. And it's much more difficult now. I guess, you know, you've mm. got to be into the, your Facebook groups and, and that could be, should be one way of tapping involvement. Right. One of the um, issues we have now is that only riparian, only people who share a border will be told or will have advance notice oh, of great. developments. No, it's not great. <laughs> oh, that's two, what I mean. With two, houses, two houses down you don't know. <laughs> you, so, exactly. You know, yeah. and downstream or across the road or where the water might run from, they don't know that there's going to be a development there that's going to impact on the, them being flooded inadvertently yeah. or, or some or any other issue like yeah. they don't have they don't have fresh air coming through and they don't have sunlight. So yes. those sorts of things have not uh, aren't happening now either. Uh, and that that affects our quality of life and getting back to economic well being. It surely does. Yes. Yeah. So um, being I mean, proactive might be a bit hard, Mike, when we don't know what's happening down the road. Yes. Right. I mean, once it was the, um, you know, the, the poster on, on a, a block of land that told you something was going to happen oh. and you could go and find out about it. But to all intents and purposes, my walking around neighbourhoods, I don't ever see anything like that. And you've kind of just got to probably find out when it's too late that something's about to happen. Okay. So... <clears throat> Um, if there's no comments, I would like. I know that there's several people who haven't had a chance to speak, and I and I just want to check that people have been in the Slido. 
and that there's some recommendations and some um, opinions and things in the Slido. So we can use your actual words in our declaration and we can be true to our participation because we have to model what we want from elsewhere. And uh, if we don't do it that honestly, we can't, we're, not, we're not meeting our own values. Um, before I decide to ring the bell and not record, I would like Lani to, to contribute to because um, you've just finished um, an interesting adventure in Brisbane, um, even though that you live up near Gympie now. And, uh, would, um, and the things we've been talking about early in this session really impacted upon you, like nature-based solutions and like um, <laughs> regenerative cities, actually having, um, having developments and improving developments recommendations for these natural infrastructure that doesn't cost anything to maintain. So um, Lani, would you like to just have your tuppence worth? We can't hear you. You're still on. The Sorry, I was. I had. It was. The, I had to unmute behind my other screen. <laughs> so, sorry about that. Um, thank you for throwing me in the deep end, Danelle. No, you don't have to. You don't have to feel like that. I can turn the recording off um, if you prefer. I always enjoy um, being part of um, part of the discussions and and listening to what's going on. Um, I've just finished a short term role back in development assessment. So I've just put a little note in there about um, signage and um, it's interesting to hear people's thoughts about what um, the issues are about development assessment from outside of um, working in that field. Um, but then a lot of things that, um, anyway, I won't go on about that right now. Um, we are currently, personally, we are in a flood zone again um, for I don't know how many times this year. We've just spent the last three days knee deep or more in water trying to save our sheep. And, um, you know, and the whole, <laughs> everything is, you know, the chaos is everywhere. So the sheep are safe. They are back and, and back at home. Um, the, the, you know, they're just the stresses of that are affecting a lot of people in a lot of places right now. So, um, anyway, your, your special contribution as a landscape architect and dealing with planning and development assessment, you're in a, you've been in a position where you can really improve with recommendations for, for the nature-based infrastructure, oh. which Kerry talked about and has a recommendation early on in the session. Kerry, I was very, um, I really enjoyed hearing what you had to say about infrastructure too, because over the years in different council roles and um, in the private sector working in, um, in that field with infrastructure, I, I understand, it, you know, the arguments between councils and state and the different people and, you know, the different stakeholders is always about, well, who's going to maintain it? Um, and I also worked on the critical infrastructure plan for Brisbane City Council's current um, city plan um, back in about 2012. And um, the interesting thing for me from that was to look at all the different types of infrastructure, how they all inter interrelate, um, the forms that they take. So we've got, you know, we, we included things like hospitals and um airports and things like that as part of the infrastructure as well. So we had nodes and we had things, you know, the, the, the lines between the nodes. And everything fell into those categories. And when I put them all into, not priority, but sort of looking at what impacts on everything, you know, what, it, what impacts does this have on that? And did this kind of matrix? I saw that stormwater was the one that impacted on everything. Um, and stormwater infrastructure, and that's where the green um, nature-based infrastructure is, is has got so much to offer. And thank you, thank you for holding today's session and everyone. Right. 
I'm encouraging people again to go into the Zoom and, and if you haven't had a chance, put your recommendations in if we haven't covered anything, but put your recommendations in, in just really blunt terms because uh, we want to make sure that your words are captured properly and in the way that you want them to. So um, every time we have one of these round tables, we want to be honest to that and, and to reflect exactly in the terms that people are comfortable with. Because when we went back to Merva about having a common language as a teacher librarian, her job is to make sure, or her role is to make sure that we have a simple language people can use commonly and still understand each other. Mm -hmm. When we do interdisciplinary innovation workshops, we actually make a new language because um, our, our professions quite often argue about the, the fine threads. So we actually make new language that we all use after the workshops so that we can, we can have a better understanding. So um, <clears throat> on that note, I, we could probably stop the recording unless anyone has some final comments. Um, and, uh, Danelle, oh, does yeah. anywhere else in Australia do it any better than Southeast Queensland? Um, the pockets of excellence is where they have good community uh, cohesion. So they right. all know their neighbours and they all share with each other. Um, yes. And now Mike might have a little bit more empirical evidence, but there's always pockets of excellence around the place. Um, yes, certainly there is that advance. Go back to what we said before. I mean, there's a lot of places where it don't, doesn't work because it's too ponderous to get back to what Howard was saying, where the, the, the uh, professions, particularly the planners, uh, are too insulated and are just interested in their own stuff. I think yep. that, that's a key thing. Uh, and one thing we haven't talked about for a good some other time, perhaps, is um, the value of uh, pre-assessment uh, pre mm. before the things go in and, and that they're genuinely done. At the moment, they are, they are not that, they are just perfunctory here, we want to do this, yeah, yeah put it in. Uh, yeah. But if you had more people from outside involved at that stage, yes. when the application is about to come in and, yeah. and just get a, a feel from a bit from the community, a bit from a, a professional body or, or whatever, to, to, to say this is worth putting in. You can still put it in if you're a developer mm. or whatever, you can still yeah. put it in, but you know, here's here's the general temperature of the water for this. And if yeah. you structured that correctly, that, that would help. Yeah. Right. Mm. I think we rely on the old fashioned, am I a good neighbor if you're going mm. to develop in your own streetscape or your own That's community? Right. I mean, you'd go like the there's a mosque being built quite close to us here and they went out to the community before the mosque was approached to look mm. at the traffic implications not mm. not cultural things I mean that's going to come up anyway one way or another but you know the the actual practical things to have every Friday afternoon to have thousands of people to, you know just trying to get into one tiny little road into a mosque you know mm. it's um the ju just that's just Friday afternoon. So the thing is, or Friday lunchtime. So just some of the some of the issues. So I'm so pleased that that community went out and it went to all of the near nearby suburbs. Um, I don't think it's a done deal, but the thing is, we're a lot more inclusive. It talked about, you know, when you have a place to worship, it means that people are have are centered and and comfortable and and happy to use that word happy and by and that is important infrastructure social infrastructure to have in our communities because then we do have that sense of belonging for people and especially young men and young women who who don't have that sense of belonging these days mm. so you know it's a good yeah. long-term investment so we were had the opportunity to talk about the pluses as well as the um the po problems Sure. Um, Thank so, you. Okay. Uh, Pam, did you want to contribute anything? Pam Caspani? Uh, yeah, thanks, Janelle. Um, I guess I was thinking about um, something that Mike said that, you know, we exist um, in a real place and um, are even individuals in a real place. And at the moment, um, taking a sabbatical with three children, you can probably hear yelling in the background. Um, 
And I'm just sort of wondering, um, what do you think in terms of our economic um, well-being in Southeast Queensland, um, given the amount of homelessness or, um, you know, the, the state of the housing for elderly, um, it seems to be diminishing, if anything. Um, and what as individuals can we do about it? And not, you know, going to talk to our counsellors, but, um, you know, getting involved and um, feeling like we have agency to actually act, um, you know, for that disadvantage. Well, I got off my bottom 13 years ago and built a housing for disability. But, um, yeah, but I felt like, and what's happened since, of course, of different models. So that was my, my little ethical investment back then. But anyway, Mike and Kerry Ann and Kerry might want to say something. I don't know if I should start, but, I mean, there's a few things, building blocks that are absolutely ethical and important. I mean, one is that in a place like Australia, you cannot have people living on the streets unless they particularly want to live on the street. You know, that, that's okay. They can go do what they like. But it's, there's a few things like that, like primary health care, uh, what's happening to anybody vulnerable, really, including the aged. I mean, there's just no excuse. No, no, nothing else matters, in my opinion, uh, past those, at least to get a basic level. If people are actually living on the streets or in their cars who don't want to be there, you know, that, that's a sign that we're failing if, if that's, that's happening, and particularly if it's a growing problem, which of course it is. Yeah. I think, um, you know, as individuals, one thing that we could look at, and I'm, I'm not a member of this group, I'm not, you know, an organiser of the group, but um, organisations like YIMBY, Yes in My Backyard, to, you know, to recognise that there are, when we're not going to be NIMBYs and try and put things off that we don't want. <laughs> you know, we want good development. We don't want every development. We want good development in our backyards. And as, as groups, as individuals, we can, you know, support and, and look towards those sorts of groups that are looking for good development, not every development. Um, can I say, Pamela, I think that's a, it is a really important issue. I'm glad you've raised that question. Um, okay, I've Kerry. Got, yeah. Sorry, Aunt Lani, I spoke. Sorry. Kerry McGovern, did you want to make any comment about agency? <clears throat> I mean, this is a this is a huge issue worldwide, <clears throat> um, and we've got humans just crowding out all sorts of life forms. And um, you've probably all seen the meme that's going around. It was a pack of cards with the chap on the top with the house saying, "Why do we have to look after all these other life forms when actually we live on top of all these life forms and we rely on them?" So somehow um, we've really got to address the big questions. You know, like too many humans spread over too big a spot that aren't looking after, you know, like houses that are wall-to-wall -wall concrete on, on, on um, it, the design is totally inappropriate and it's leading to flooding. It's, there's a whole heap of stuff. But it also, it's, it's, it's um, I think, Donnell, on one of your earlier slides, you talk about the soul. You know, yes. people, people need nature and it needs us to, 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 to work together to protect and look after. And, um, you know, housing without nature is no housing at all. Mm. You know, we're not li living in high rise in Stockholm, looking out <clears throat> into another house, another concrete block. It's not exactly what people want. And, um, you and know, Europe what... protects their wild spaces. It protects their, their, their green space. And I think for some reason... Europeans in Australia just haven't seen the benefit. And I think it's, you know, there's a whole, there's a whole conversation there, Pamela. You've started a whole new conversation. So this is yeah. where regional landscapes made a fantastic contribution for 17 years. And they pulled together, it was 19 councils, now it's 10 regional shires, uh, 10 regional councils. But when you think of... Um, which was regionally significant, the sorts of things that they wanted to, or they advocated for uh, that was going to benefit a whole range 
of of people and outcomes and living living lungs for Brisbane shouldn't just be Victoria Park, which is now going to be developed. Um, you know, <laughs> living lungs for Brisbane had to be the Carawathas and and the Down Four Creeks and all those sorts of things. But um, and we shouldn't have to travel to Boona so that we can have a, a bushwalk. You know, wrong answer. Yeah. Um, so, Elizabeth, have you had a chance to say anything yet? Um, I think I'm all right. I think there's been some good things that have come through from other people. Okay. And the panellists. Yes. So is, look there, is there any social housing, quote, unquote, that's being constructed around Brisbane or South East Queensland at the moment? Is there any responsibility for that? Whose brief is it? it uh, did it used to be done in Brisbane? I mean, there were, I can remember housing commission that the state government constructed. Has there been anything since then? Do you want the well, bad news got, or the good news? <laughs> yeah, you've got like the Brisbane housing companies and the, the Logan, Logan housing. It seems to be, you know, some of those partnerships between local authorities and, and right. quasi, um, yeah, oh, quasi, you know, public development, <laughs> I guess. Um, yes. but they seem to be the ones that are keen. Um, Department of Housing are certainly looking for more sites and development that I'm aware of. So Right. Thank you. The Logan Logan councils and most of the councils used to used to build pensioners' cottages. They are tiny little places and pensioners' cottages, and yes. of course they take a little bit of maintenance. Yeah, and um, you know Everything they do does. have they do have changeover of ownership when people get a little bit older and and mm. and sign out. So um, now Logan City Council is selling are uh, selling their pensioners' cottages, much to the chagrin of the of the yeah. SUD community. Right. Yeah. Um, uh, Merva, were you with us when we had our housing? Our housing? Yes, I was. Yes. Okay. Yeah. yeah. Well, um, the thing is, if we're going to be selling or getting rid of those pensioners' cottages and we're not replacing them with something better, like Darren Mew suggested with the, yeah. um, you know, the lifts that take us up 12 floors but still have good infrastructure and good services provided cheaply because it's intense living. Um, if they're not replacing them with that, we do have a deficit. Yes. Um, uh, but anyway, Mike, 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 Mike might know more about that. Do we're you? around the world is, is doing social housing and doing it well. Ah, Kerry, Kerry's been working on this with her groups, Kerry McGovern and Kerry Ann. Uh, we can't hear you. I can't. have to leave. I'm sorry. I'm going to have oh, to leave. Yes, it is six, nearly six. Look, thank you. I know several of you have been very ill the last few weeks, and I'm so pleased. Um, Merva and we can stay behind if Kerry leaves. Um, so, um, right. Do we have any closing comments? Hey, uh, can I just leave almost with a, a well, it is an anecdote, but okay, but just gets back to what we're saying about uh, you know protecting the right areas and 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 the scale of areas and things like this. Can I take you back about uh, 12, I don't know, 12 years, 15 years ago, and we did uh, Rose Street Parklands, right? And um, Wayne Goss was <laughs> God love him was in the, the the premier, and every week he it was his passion that project and every week we'd go up to the premier's office and, and, and get a belting because it wasn't going fast enough slow enough and so anyway, look, very quickly he said i want this green lung he said i want this to be like central park it was yes sir yes sir and one of the people back in the department got a map of new york and overlaid central park over brisbane and it, it went to from <laughs> Gardens Point QUT to Kelvin Grove QUT. And I said to the Director General, we marched up for our blogging as usual. Are you going to tell him or am I? And he said, neither of us are going to tell him. So, so it's the truth, the power thing. It's sort of trying to get that vision across about what's there. Sorry, a long story, but you know, that's, that's what it's like in government. Um, yeah. <laughs> well, it's apocryphal. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's exactly, exactly. Well, in 25 years, we've gone from 
green space in Brisbane to 17%. And I think we're down, yeah. no, no, we're down to something less now, like seven. Yes. Um, and the thing is, we, we forget that infill development can be a lot of mums and dads. It doesn't have to be big development companies. Yes. In fact, there's more action in the renovations and granny flats for um, mums and dads and more mm. investment in that than there is in the big ones that are going broke. So yes. I think... I think we've got to think about how we how we deal with what we've got and capitalise on what's existing uh, and to be smarter about it. So Back, back to the micro and the neighbourhood stuff. Yeah. yeah. Okay, ha yeah. Howard? Uh, I'm afraid I'll have to go. Uh, thank, thank you very much. much for the conversation. Thank you. Thank you, how, thank you for joining us. Okay. okay. Any last comments, anybody else? I don't want to cut anyone off. Yeah. Wonderful. Look, thank you so much for lasting the distance. It's been a wonderful conversation that you probably wouldn't have anywhere else. Yeah. And um, I look forward to keeping in touch with you or yeah. our team does because we want to take actions after this. Mm. And it's so lovely to get to meet you and get to understand where, where you sit in the, in the scheme of things. So thank you for your time. And yeah. I want to shout your lunches as often as possible. <laughs> What yeah. else? Yeah. So I do appreciate your time and your and your wisdom and your guidance. It's been wonderful to have really different thoughts. So on that note, thank you and good, good night. See you now. Thank All you right. for thank a fun you. afternoon. Thank you. Thank you. I'm good happy night. to talk to you about that uh, injurious infection sometime too. Yes. Yes. Please. Okay. We've got to oh, eat that elephant. Okay. okay. Bye. <laughs> okay. Thank you.